We are picking up at Matthew 13, verse 53, and just kind of reset the stage. This is following the parables that Jesus taught. He did a, a series of parables, and now he's moving on from that. And it's as, as we look at this and think about the timing of things, there really is, if you were to to kind of with the with the gospel of Matthew, put a pin in the time when things started to get tough, it would be now. It would be Matthew 13, 53. You know, in the Gospel of John, it's very obvious in, in John 6 already, where the, the Jews start sparring with him. Here it is um, in Matthew, it's Matthew 13, 53, and we'll we'll see why in a minute. And just a reminder to everyone, there is a playlist out there for the Gospel of Matthew. We've gone all the way through it up to this point. You can go out and and start at the beginning and listen through if you so choose. So, verse 53, and when Jesus had finished these parables, just said, he was teaching in parables, He went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Okay, it makes it clear sequentially this is going on immediately after what we just saw. The, that, that introduction makes it clear. And I just popped the map up here because we love maps. He was up here in Capernaum. That's where he was teaching. And he came down here to Nazareth. And Nazareth was one of those places that was kind of thought of by everyone as that backwater place, okay? It was still, it was here in Galilee. It was part of the nation of Israel, but it was nowhere, okay? And and to everybody, wherever you might live, you know, in Minnesota, people make fun of Iowa. In Iowa, people make fun of Minnesota. In Indiana, everybody makes fun of Kentucky, right? You, you've you got that other state that you kind of pick on. That's what Nazareth was, okay? It was nothing, nothing special. That's why a couple times people, even one of his disciples says Nazareth, you know, Philip says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, you're talking about the Messiah here, and he's coming from where? From from Nazareth? Whoa. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. So that's the geographical setting. It's over here in this in this hill country. Okay. The reaction is interesting. And it, it's important to and I preach this all the time, get inside the heads of the people that were there. He grew up there. And and this wasn't like today where everybody moves away and heads off to different parts of the world. You didn't do that. You stayed there. It was a, you kind of had your family collective there. And that's, that's laid out. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, they're all there. And Jesus comes in, and what have we said again and again, and what has been commented on by others about Jesus' teaching? He is teaching with authority. And and to some extent, I'm not making excuses for their unbelief. I'm not doing that. But understanding the situation is important because who Jesus was before he began his ministry 
and who he was a carpenter. Okay. Who he was after he publicly entered his ministry with his baptism by John and temptation out in the wilderness, and then coming and saying, I'm the Messiah, making that very clear and what he was saying, how he was saying it, and the way he taught. And all of you can probably, everybody out there, wherever you might be, think of someone who, and I'm not talking about some flowery, you know, charismatic kind of speaker, not that kind of thing, but someone who, when they spoke, when they taught, think back to college, who was that professor who, when they taught, boom, they had your attention. They taught with authority. They knew what they were doing. You could tell they knew what they were doing and you didn't doubt them. Okay. Now take that to, you know, 10 to the 60th power. (laughs) <laughs> with who you had teaching with Jesus. It made their heads spin. He grew up there, right? He was the carpenter's son. He trained as a carpenter. He didn't go off to the rabbi schools. He didn't go off like Paul and study at the feet of Gamaliel, which was like going to Oxford or something like that. No, he was a carpenter and he came back and he's teaching just the way he'd been teaching everywhere else. Why? Because that's who he was. That's what he was supposed to do. And and we can understand the way he was before as a carpenter, as a full manifestation of his humility, understanding the humility of Christ. His humiliation is very important. You and I think of humiliation. I think of my most painful defeat in sports as a kid or you know, getting fired somewhere or asking a girl out and her saying no, those kind of things that are humiliating. That's that's not what humiliation means. Humiliation is lowering yourself in the sense of Christ and his ministry. It's not making full advantage or any advantage of your divine power. That's easy for me. I don't have any divine power, right? Jesus was fully God, but all the time growing up, that didn't show other than the fact that he was the kid who never misbehaved. He was the kid who was always good. He was the kid who was always on time and polite and respectful and all of those things. But besides that, beside that, you couldn't tell that he was the son of God. Mary and Joseph knew but no one else knew. So now he he was still in a state of humiliation. When wasn't he in a state of humiliation? He wasn't in a state of humiliation when we're going to get to, not too long from now, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he let his divine glory show. And they were blown away. The three disciples who went with him were, were blown away. He let his divine glory, the Shekinah, the glory of God, shine forth, right? He, he, he let some of his divine power out when they came to arrest him, and he said, I am he, and they drew back and fell to the ground. He knocked them over just with his word. He, he, he let his divine power show when he healed people, when he cast out demons, when he feeds 5,000, which if I quit yakking, we'll get to today, Okay. But all of a sudden, from what they see, a switch has been flipped, and he's a different guy. And you can tell, read through it again, they're they're trying to figure it out. What's going on here, right? Doesn't excuse unbelief because the power of the Holy Spirit was still there working on their hearts in the word proclaimed by God himself. And they're saying, where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. The other part, being mystified, confused, whoa, what's going on? That's one thing. They took offense at him. They were offended. Who does this guy think he is? That, that's what that means. Uh, where did this nobody carpenter come to be this guy purporting to be something special? But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. 
don't we we just talked about the divine the 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 divine nature that is there in Christ don't forget the humanity because we always struggle with that right do you think that he wasn't down do you think that this didn't make him sad do you think it didn't break his heart the people he cared about most were rejecting him and it's worse than just you know your community and those of you who grew up and maybe still live in the same small town your community completely rejecting you that's one thing and his own household and we just had listed off his brothers and not by name but his his brothers by name but not his sisters Important to note, James, he's the James who wrote the book of James. He's the James who is the head of the church when we get to Acts 15. Jude, Judas, Jude, he's the one who wrote the book of Jude. So they came around. They came to faith. But at this point, they did not believe in him. And with that... um, John 7, 5, for even his own brothers did not believe, sorry, for not even his brothers believed in him. And in Mark 6, 6, which is a parallel to this, because Mark and Matthew kind of follow the same outline, different take on things, different emphasis, there it says that he marveled because of their unbelief. It, it struck him, it, it, but it also hurt him. Being rejected at home. You know what we all want and need and strive for? Our family's approval, especially our father and mother, but then your brothers and sisters. Think of whoever you may be, if your brothers and sisters, you were doing what you were born to do, you know it, you're doing it, you're moving forward, and they're all telling you, what in the world do you think you're doing? Do you really think that's going to work? What's wrong with you? You've lost your mind. You're out of your gourd. Crushing, right? Crushing. Don't think he didn't feel that. Don't think that it didn't bring him down. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Remember casting your pearls before swine? He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to do it. You don't believe? I'm not going to do mighty works here. Why? Because you'll just reject those as well. So he didn't, it's not that he couldn't have done a lot of mighty works there. He certainly could have. He wasn't going to play to that audience. It just wasn't going to happen. And the hits just keep on coming. That's kind of the theme here. The hits just keep on coming. You know how um, one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard was this speaker at a conference, and and he said, you know, people whine and complain, and they say, it just can't get any worse than this. And he said, that is a challenge you don't want to lay down because it can always get worse. Jesus wasn't saying it can't get any worse there, but it's kind of the when it rains, it pours thing. He's rejected in his hometown. And now this, at that time, do you get Matthew's making it clear, concurrent with this, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. Stop there. When Herod the Great, who was terrible, Herod the Great was terrible. He was a great king. He was a terrible human being. He was insane at the end of his life. He was a great politician. He was a horrible person, but he built really cool stuff, like a really cool temple, among other things. When he died, his where he ruled there in Judea, over all Judea, which he had finagled to keep that going with Rome, even after he took the wrong side in a civil war, he was such a good schmoozer that he managed to talk his way out of it and kept power. When he died, his region there was broke up into four, broken up into four parts. And Herod the Tetrarch, one of his sons, Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch simply has to do with one-fourth, 
you know, he ruled up there in Galilee. Okay. At that time, and it gets confusing because you hear about Herod, you think, oh yeah, he's the one who tried to kill Jesus. No, he's been gone a long time. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. If the, the ruler hears it, the buzz is going around. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So palace intrigue, Herod the Tetrarch had married his brother's wife, okay? And, and John the Baptist, if there's, you know, John the Baptist wasn't going to pull any punches about anything. He told the scribes and the Pharisees that they were a brood of vipers. And, and we hear that and say, yeah, he's letting them have it. <laughs> Nobody ever said that kind of stuff to them. No one ever said that kind of stuff to him. John the Baptist didn't. He didn't think twice. He didn't flinch. He was the one who was sent to call sin, sin, and call for repentance. He told the Roman soldiers what to do. No fear. No fear. He's the guy who, you know, there's the old saying, he'd bare fist a locomotive. That, that's John the Baptist. And he was telling Herod the Tetrarch and everybody else that he should marry her. It's not lawful for you to have her. It's it's against Torah. And though he wanted to put him to death, he was infuriated. He feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. We always we get this notion that kings could do whatever they wanted. They couldn't do whatever they wanted because they had to keep their people happy, right? It, it, there was always a balance, balancing act going on. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Translate, drunken beer bash with his buddies. Drunken beer bash with his buddies. And she danced, and you can draw your own conclusions. He was hammered and promised to give her anything she wanted. Don't make promises when you're drunk. Don't be drunk. But if you are drunk, don't make promises. Prompted by her mother, she went and talked to mom. Hey, your husband just promised to give me anything up to half his kingdom. What do I do? Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his, and I don't know how sorry he was. I think he was probably sorry because of the the political fallout, but it's not like he felt bad for John the Baptist. And I'll read through the rest of this. Imagine John the Baptist is a relative. Imagine he's your best friend. Imagine he's your cousin. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. He, he was like at a slaughterhouse. There's no dignity in death at a slaughterhouse, right? They sent guards down. One guard held him down. The other took a sword and lopped his head off, threw it on a platter, and brought it up and, and gave it to her. It just horrible, awful, terrible thing when it's somebody that it happened to anybody, especially a guy who was the greatest of all the prophets. I, I never, I, 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 this is for me. Don't you ever whine about anything you suffer because of your faith, because of your holding fast to the truth. You don't do it. Don't whine. Don't complain. Because if that can happen to John the Baptist, just, just deal with it. Just deal with it. You'll be one of the saints under the altar crying out to the Lord, how long, how long, oh Lord? And he says a little bit longer, right? One of those was John the Baptist. He got his head cut off 
for the faith. And the disciples came and buried it, buried his body, and they went and told Jesus. Now, we talked about the hits just keep on coming and things turning. When that happened, put yourself in Jesus' place. There's a really powerful scene in The Chosen that we watched just the other day, one of the newer episodes, and Jesus is walking into Jerusalem and they're crucifying people outside of town. And as he walks, he looks up and looks at it, and you can just see his mind going. Because he knows where he's going. He knows what's going to happen, right? When John the Baptist went down this way, what do you think that did in Jesus' heart? The, the man, the man, what he knew was coming, things were turning, the tide was turning, and things were going to get bad, and he was going to suffer and die. His, his forerunner, who was also his cousin, was gone. So I would think, I, I've never had a day like that, get rejected by your family, your hometown, and then get news that John was beheaded at a drunken beer bash because a girl danced. Uh, just tragic, tragic. Now, now when Jesus heard this, see, this just keeps going one after the other. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. I would think so. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And what did he do? He said, hey, guys, I just had the worst day. Please just give me some me time. Just leave me be. I need some time to myself. I, I wouldn't bat an eye if that's what he said. But when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, so what did he do? All day, he healed them. That's all he did. In the midst of his affliction, his broken heart, his lowest moment thus far in his life, he spent the day healing others. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. And the crowds, send the crowds away into the villages to buy food for themselves. Perfectly logical. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and, and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Paying attention in your reading, in your study, in your spending time with the Lord in his word, paying attention to the sequence. Really important because we let these headings, Jesus feeds the 5,000, it's like it's a new chapter or something. That's not the case. That's not the case. This was all sequential, one after the other after the other. So in his lowest moment, he put aside his grief. He remembered what is said about him in the 20th chapter, the 28th verse of this book, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You want to be like Jesus, be selfless. Look at people with compassion. It's what he does here, right? I don't know how he mustered compassion. I don't know. 
I don't know. In his moment of loss and suffering and the the harbinger that was of what was to come, he put it all aside and he saw those people and his first thought was to have compassion on them. They had walked all the way around to get there, right? And he had compassion on them and he spent the rest of the day healing them. And then he performed arguably next to raising someone from the dead, the son of the widow of Nain and, and, and Lazarus. And uh, apart from that, the, the times he raised people from the dead, that was an exhaustive list. The feeding of the 5,000 has to be his greatest miracle, right? He fed 5,000 people with five loaves, and they were little loaves. These were like the little travel loaves. It wasn't like a loaf of Wonder Bread. It was a small little loaf that people would pack with them, five loaves and two fish, and there were 12 basketfuls left over. So when you go through that, when you think it through, when, when you get your mind into trying to get into what Jesus felt, what he experienced, what all was going on, you just stand in awe. You stand in awe of who he was and how selfless he was and that he was always serving others. You know, you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane when he's suffering and praying and sweating blood, and he comes back, and he's compassionate to the disciples about their state of mind and where they're at. It, it, it's, it is a mindset and, and a big part of Christ being formed in us, which Paul talks about. That's what growth in faith is. We are becoming more and more, the little Christ in us is getting stronger. It's growing. It's hopefully taking more control over my emotions and suppressing my weaknesses and pushing those things aside and helping me to see the world the way the Lord Jesus Christ sees the world. And the key to that is I don't come first. I don't come first. Every time I think I have the right to be upset about something, I, I, I just make a mess of things. I hurt people and, and I hate myself for it. And it's the very opposite of the way Christ did things. At his lowest moment, he put all that aside and served others. The Son of Man, that's Matthew 20, 28, did not come to be served. He had every right. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You can take that to when he goes to the cross for those who hated him and prayed for those who were driving spikes through his wrists and ankles. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He didn't say that just to be impressive. He meant it. So we could go on and on, but we need to stop because our time has, has flown. I want to thank you for listening. I want to encourage you. Give us a thumbs up. It really does make a difference. I also invite you to subscribe. And if you subscribe, then make sure and hit the notification bell so that you are made aware when we put out new content. Please share this video with others. Share it on your social media platform. Send it to anyone you think might benefit from this teaching. And finally, come and pay us a visit. This is our website, decodingthedeception.com. If you know our name, you know the website. We've got all our Bible teaching videos out here as well as a host of other resources to help you be informed so that you can decode the deception. This is Matthias 76 together we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.